I want to speak today uh, for the remaining time that we have uh, the topic that I will call it one thing somebody shout one thing now say a little bit louder on the back one thing one thing those of you on live stream drop that in the chat one thing we're going to look at three verses in the scripture about one thing my desire today is not only to hype us but for the Lord to help build a holy habit somebody say a holy habit many Christians live by hype in January they get excited in February they go like a submarine back to their old habits God doesn't want you to go to your old habits he wants you to go to your holy habits somebody say amen in Psalm 27 and verse 4 as you're opening your Bible and you can do it on your view version Bible app we have notes as well in verse 1 David goes in and starts talking about the things he's encountering how the wicked have come against him they're trying to eat up his flesh his enemies are against him but they stumbled and fell an army came against him but he says my heart is not going to be afraid a war is rising up against me but I will be confident then verse 4 he says this one thing I have desired of the Lord that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple David's situation represents warfare spiritual life is really a warfare life many of us are dealing with demons that didn't start with us they started with our parents grandparents and other people we're dealing with inclinations we're dealing with attitudes we're dealing with problems that honestly are generational and God's way of breaking generational curses is not only out 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 you puke throw out fall roll on the floor shake and bake and you come out you're like hey I am free God's way of dealing with generational curses is to disconnect you from the past of your family tree and connect you to the destiny of his house God wants to disconnect us from the bad things that happened in our house where we grew up and connect us to the good things that happen in his house where he wants us to dwell can somebody say amen I want you to notice what David says this one thing I seek now you would think that thing would be to be in God's presence you would think that thing would be to be in God's Word but David says to dwell somebody say dwell somebody drop that in the chat dwell in God's house now dwelling is different than visiting occasionally dwelling is different like our sister mentioned is coming like a CEO Christmas Easter only dwelling is different than like some people come when they are hatched matched and dispatched hatched when they're born you come the priest sprinkles you with water you're matched you're getting married the priest pronounces you as husband and wife and you're dispatched meaning they bring you in a casket dwelling is different than that David says this one thing I desired to dwell in the Lord's house and then he says this when I get to God's house this is what I want to do there behold the beauty of God he doesn't say when I get there I want to gossip He doesn't say I want to come in there and criticize I am not there to behold everybody else's ugliness because we all come here different people different problems different challenges and some of us when we come to church we're busy beholding everybody else instead of the presence of God and David says I want to be grounded and planted in God's house I want to be blessed in that house and in that house I have one desire I want to behold God's beauty I want to see the glory of God if you come to church I want to invite you when worship happens to begin to behold God's beauty not just the lyrics on the screen not just how somebody else is worshiping but begin to press into God altars are always empty that means that you can freely leave your seat and come and worship at the altar why because the idea is not to just sing a song is to behold the beauty of God and then David says and to inquire in the temple of God this is why it's important to turn the house of prayer not just into the house of preaching but into the house of worship and the house of prayer somebody say amen, amen. in Psalm 23 this guy David says things like the Lord is my shepherd and most of you probably have memorized that Psalm I shall shall not lack he leads me beside the still waters 
He makes me lay down at green pastures. You know, He leads me in the righteous path for His name's sake. He restores my soul and then everything goes bad. Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they're they comfort me and then he says you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies then my cup you know it runs over my head is anointed with oil surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and then he ends the psalm with this and I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life that means whatever roller coaster life offers whether I am in the valley or my cup is running over, whether I'm poor or I am prosperous, whether I am healthy or I am sick, I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. In Psalm, David says, a righteous man will be like a cedar in Lebanon. And he says, and they will flourish in the courts of our God, those that are planted. Somebody shall plant it. So not those who occasionally visit but planted in the house of God and then he says when they get old they will be fruitful. So if you're older than me you're old. You can be fruitful. I'm just kidding. You can be flourishing as you're getting old. Not cranky, not whiny, not grumpy, not like always whining and complaining. God says your old age you will be fresh, flourishing and fruitful because you're grounded in God's house. I claim that promise. I say, Lord, me and my house will serve the Lord. I will dwell in God's house. And when I am old, I'm gonna be as good looking as I am right now. I'm gonna be anointed. I'm gonna be fruitful and I'm going to be fresh. Somebody shout, I receive. Practically, how do we apply this? Three practical applications. We're in the church, this is not a crusade. So we want you to apply this at home. The first thing that I want you to apply and that is this, stop saying I don't go to church, I am the church. This is why. Theologically it's not correct. Word church means an assembly, a gathering, ecclesia. If, if you've been to a school, in high school for example, we had an assembly. Assembly meant all the students assemble together. Now imagine if I would walk around in high school and say, I am the assembly, I don't go to assembly. They would send me to a counselor's office. Why? Because an assembly is the gathering of students. It's not a gathering of a student. A church is the gathering of people. It's not one person. So technically, theologically and scripturally, you cannot walk around. I know it's a cliche. I know it will get you a lot of retweets on Twitter. And I know a lot of your friends will say, yeah, that's right. You know, church is not four walls. That's true. But church is a gathering of people. If you're not gathering with people, stop saying you are a church. It's like my liver saying, I am the body. Uh, no, you're not. You are in the body. You're an organ, but you are not the body. So I play a role in the body and you play the role in the body. So we have to shift to a biblical understanding of the church. Somebody say amen. Second practical step that we can do when it comes to dwelling this year in a local church. And that is this. If you have had a bad church experience, which means if you grew up in church, you probably should have had bad experience by now. <clears throat> Even if you went to a perfect church. It's important not to give up on the church when you get hurt in a church. Um, in 2007, it was my time, I was about 21 years of age and um, I wanted to get ready to be a potential um, husband. So I was looking for a wife, I had a house, I just needed a nice car. And so my dad recommended to get a Japanese car because he says they, you know, save you money, they don't break a lot and they're cheap to fix. But of course, when you're single, you're bachelor and, and you walk around with little uh, reputation you think that you're anointed I did not want a Toyota I wanted something more uh, beefy with a little turbo or something so I went for Mazda so I went to a local dealership I will not mention which dealership I went to and uh, I saw this good-looking amazing Mazda it looked at me good and we had a little instant connection and so I went for it the lady who sells me this Mazda actually rips me off now I don't know that I'm being ripped off because I am on emotional high. I come back home, my dad checks the papers, he checks everything, he's like, dude, they just gave you a lemon. They ripped you off. It's supposed to be a new car, it's not a new car. All of these things are wrong. I texted them and I said, hey guys, you ripped me off. And so the next uh, day, which was Monday, I came back, I returned the car 
they apologized and um, I had a really bad experience in the dealership. Interestingly, that lady came to church last Sunday. She's like, do you remember me? I was like, get behind me, Satan, in Jesus' name. You're bringing my trauma. I need to see a therapist. <laughs> you know, and I was seeing, of course, I'm joking. But, um, and I was like, did you get saved today? Because I'm like, you need to get saved for what you did. Of course, it wasn't her fault. It was her boss's fault. That's what every salesman says. And so, um, it was not her fault. She is not working there anymore. All those bosses are not working there anymore. And so, we had a really fun uh, in, in, uh, conversation. And interesting that the next week after I returned Mazda, I went to the Toyota dealership and bought a Toyota. My hurt and bad experience at Mazda dealership did not cause me to not ride a car at all. Many people get hurt at the church, bad experience at the church, toxic leadership, abusive leadership, this and that. And so what the devil wants to do is he wants you to completely walk away from the church instead of walk away from that church when you got hurt or maybe you had a bad experience I want to challenge you this year get over that release that and give the church find a different church where you can be planted don't let the enemy win by making you say stay away from the church of Jesus Christ because you got hurt at a church of Jesus Christ the same way as with me like if I would say I am never going to drive a car now because this person disappointed me then you know today I would have to come on the bus and so I had to overcome now I'll be honest with you I will not go to that dealership till the rest of my life I don't care how many managers they've changed that place bad for me but it doesn't mean that I'm not going to trust anybody else from this point forward and so just because you had a bad experience you know you might walk away from that place but at the same time trust in Jesus and I want you to try to give the church of Jesus Christ another chance being planted in God's house third thing practically how do we apply this and that is for those of you who just recently gave your life to Jesus you may be plugged in in our small groups or maybe you've been coming quite a few of you came up and said what's the next step how do I become a part of Hungry Gen? We have this thing called membership, new membership dinner. And the dates are right behind me. If you are interested and you've been in our church for a while, we want to welcome you to become a part of this house. We're not just a ministry. We are a local church that have a vision, small groups, training for children, training for disciples and leaders. Yes, we have a global vision as well, but we are a local church and this is a great opportunity where we serve you dinner, where we share our vision and then you get a chance to either decide to go, make a decision to be a part of it or not. Why am I speaking this on this Sunday? Because this is the first, I would say, month of this year and this will be a good, healthy, holy decision that you can make this year for you and your family to be grounded in the church if you don't want to be grounded at hungry gen there are so many amazing churches all around in tri-cities come to me afterwards and i'll recommend you some they're amazing churches in tri-cities we're not the only church we're not the only one that got the holy spirit we're not the only one that has an amazing everything there's amazing churches there but i would encourage you that you find one and you get grounded and get planted in that church one thing somebody say one thing i have desired to dwell in god's house now i want you to go to the new testament and that is luke chapter 10 and those of you online drop number one in the chat if you're still with us so Luke chapter 10 and verse I will read 42 and then give you an explanation of what happened here in the context but one thing is needed so my second point is one thing is needed say this with me say one thing is needed and Mary but Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her so David is in war and he's saying I'm gonna dwell this one thing I desire is to dwell in God's house Mary is not in war she is in worry demons she cannot blame because Jesus is in her living room Jesus along with disciples uh, Martha I apologize not Mary are in, in Mary's and Martha's house and Jesus is teaching his disciples Martha is in the kitchen busy 
things are not working out the stove is probably not warming up properly some foods are getting like too too cold some are getting too hot she's just frustrated she does not have a good day and so Martha is worried she has Jesus in her house so David says I want to be in God's house Martha got it better she got Jesus in her house when you're a Christian you have Jesus living in your heart which is his house can somebody say amen now we, we go to God's house but we also have God living in our own house and if that is happening with you shout amen, amen. now having Jesus in your house does not automatically remove your anxiety depression fear overthinking jealousy orphan spirit or worry if we would Mary wouldn't be worried and troubled so many Christians are living huh? Martha I apologize Martha so many Christians especially in the Western countries as well as those of you watching us online live today depressed worried with anxiety on antidepressants on anxiety medication and this is interesting while they have Jesus in their own life you may say how would you explain that very simple Jesus actually gives a solution to that he tells Martha he says your problem is not demons your problem is not spells or witches your problem is not generational curses and your problem is not me because she came blaming Jesus she says Jesus why can't you do something about this and then when she saw that Jesus wasn't taking the bait she started to blame Mary her sister and Mary just like talk to my hand I don't hear you <laughs> she's just like focus on Jesus and so Jesus confronts Martha and says this Martha Martha one thing is needed David's one thing was to be in God's house Martha's one thing wasn't to get Jesus inside of her house she already covered that it's to spend time with Jesus at his feet and listen to his word what does that mean that means you can have Jesus in your heart but if you don't spend quality time every day with Jesus you will be no different than people down the street in your neighborhood in your work in your school who don't have Jesus that's why some of us were like well but I got saved I felt the tears I felt the tingling the weight lifted up I came back and my depression is back in my house what is the solution one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that thing which means this one thing of spending time with Jesus every day quality time with Jesus is not something that comes on you you have to choose it it's not a personality trait oh I'm just I'm just a Martha type of a person no 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 I just don't have this kind of a you know thing where I could just sit and enjoy Jesus I'm more rational and I just don't have time to do that stuff make time you can't do that you choose to do that this is very practical it's almost so simple we can teach it in the children's church right now but if you take 15 minutes a day of uninterrupted quality time you at the feet of Jesus praying to Jesus and then listening to Jesus something is going to happen in a matter of six months the worries you battle with today you will see that they will subside you will begin to experience victory in those areas Paul tells us in Philippians he says that do not be anxious for anything and then you would think Paul will give us some really awesome positive thinking techniques and he says but in everything through prayer and thanksgiving with supplication present your request to God Paul's antidote for anxiety is tell God what you worried about tell him what's on your mind people sometimes come up especially men I don't know what to pray about complain to him whine to him read Psalms you read Psalms half of the Psalms is like God I'm so angry I hate all those people and everything and then he ends with God I praise you you're so awesome forget everything I said before <laughs> that could be your prayer and as you complain as you whine as you as you give God everything that's on your mind God gives you his peace God begins to speak to you and this one thing can shave off worry and can shave off heaviness that you're experiencing 
I'm not against therapy. We're not against medical help. All of that has its place. But if you ignored your one thing as a Christian person, you should put that first in your life. I want to encourage you, those of you who gave up on your devotional life, to begin to start that again. Now, me and my wife have a wonderful relationship. And my wife, she has very low expectations in regards to me. Something that she said that really stood out to me and I started to think about that in my relationship to God. She said, Vlad, I really need only 15 minutes of your uninterrupted, undistracted self. She said, and after 15 minutes, my cup is full. And I said, really? 15 minutes? Because I was afraid that you were a bottomless pit. <laughs> Meaning it never ends. If I give you 15, you want more. And so, and we actually started, when we started to practice this as well, and we would go for a coffee or go for a walk, and I realized that just turning off my phone and just not talking about what I wanted to talk about, what she wants to talk about, and not overloading her with my work and my ideas and ministry's ideas and expansion and books I'm planning to write, the courses I'm trying to release, the books I'm translating, the places I'm going to go to, and the systems we're trying to implement and all of this stuff, but just talking about what's in her world, 15 minutes, and sometimes I even clock that out. I wonder... What would happen to our intimacy with God if we would give Him our attention, our affection for just 15 minutes a day? I know this does not sound very spiritual for some of you who are like, but I just want to spend five hours with God a day. That's good that you want to do that. The real question is how much do you actually spend with God? So I want to challenge you. Put something of 15 minutes a day to spend time with God. Three practical applications. One is make a decision this year once a day every other day whatever that is that this one thing in your life being at the feet of Jesus and listening to his word quality uninterrupted time second thing make a decision to bring your family to prayer at church at one of the mornings at five o'clock Monday through Friday the doors get open you may say but I pray at home why do I want to come to church David says I inquire in your temple not only I pray at home, but I also pray at your temple. I want to challenge you to begin to do that. And thirdly, I want you to develop a holy habit of memorizing scriptures this year. So we have a group right now, and this is about almost 2,000 people, where we are memorizing 100 verses a year. Doesn't sound a lot until you start doing it. And so I want to invite you as a church member, as a church visitor, to begin to do that. You may say, why would I want to memorize Bible verses? It will help you to battle with anxiety. It will help you to battle with lust. Putting your God's Word inside of you will help you to battle with sin and other things. And so, and we can coach you and help you with that. You don't have to be a Bible professor, a preacher, or an evangelist. But as a Christian, putting God's Word inside of your heart is instrumental to growing in Christ. You may say, but honestly, that's a lot. You just said 15 minutes and you loaded us with like 20 things we need to do. The Bible memory works very easy. This is where you do it. On the toilet. Most of you are with the phone. You're scrolling. And while you're waiting for a doctor's appointment. Why are you waiting at DNV while you are maybe somewhere and you're waiting for your food to come out? You pull out your phone and most of us kind of like, nobody's texting me. Let me just scroll through Facebook. And maybe instead of scrolling through Facebook for 28th time in that hour, you can just open the Bible memory app and you can just review a few verses. You'll be surprised how in one year your mental clarity will change. Your emotional state will change. Why? Because Jesus' antidote to troubled and worried about many things is one thing. And this one thing, she sa he says, spend at my feet and listen to my words like Mary does. I'm losing a lot of you now. Are you still with me? Somebody say one thing I desire. Somebody say one thing I need. And we have one more thing. And that is, let's go to Gospel of Mark. And this is verse chapter 10 and verse 17 now I'm gonna read verse 17 but the verse will be on the screen is 21 now when he was going out on the road one came running knelt before him asking him good teacher what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life Jesus skip few verses verse 21 Jesus looking at him loved him and said to him 
one thing you lack. So let's review again. Somebody say, one thing I desire. One thing I need. And then one thing I lack. Now let's look at this one thing. And Jesus says, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Come and take up your cross and follow me. So a little backstory. This guy was the guy that if you have a daughter, you want your daughter to marry him. Filthy rich, super righteous, not, not like egoistic, self-righteous person, but actually kept God's commandments. Most likely his parents were very wealthy. Most likely his grandparents were very set. Good boy, good man. And he hears about Jesus, sparked with curiosity, comes to the Lord and says, Lord, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus testing the water says, um, Ten Commandments. Honor your mom and dad, don't steal, don't kill, don't know none of this stuff. He's like, I got it, Jesus. Fulfilled it. Anything else? And this is what he should have said, just went back home. <laughs> Instead, he kind of stuck around and he really wanted to grow in Jesus. So this is for those of you who are like, man, I really want to go deeper, Vlad. I know this devotional stuff, I got that. Dwelling in God's house, man, I grew up in God's house. Tell me something I don't know. I got you. Jesus says one thing you lack. And you would think Jesus would say, have you fasted 40 days? You would think Jesus would tell him, have you ever raised the dead? Oh, you don't know how to cast out demons. Let me teach you how to be a demon slayer. Oh, let me teach you how to be an evangelist. Jesus goes straight for the kill. He goes for something this man did not even expect. He didn't even know what hit him. Because this man, he was so good. But there was one area of his life he had an idol in that he could not think of this as an idol because none of us do until God shines a light into that area of our life. I never saw that as an idol until a prolonged fasting 10 years ago. And Jesus goes for this that most of us shield our heart and we say, Jesus talk to us about anything and everything. Do not talk to us about this area. And Jesus says, I want you to go take all the money that you have and I want you to sell it. And I want you to see what Jesus does not say. He doesn't say and then sow it to Jesus Ministries International LLC. He says, sell it, give it to the poor and then go sign up with my disciples and be part of my team. And then he makes him a promise. That's a very powerful promise. He says, if you do this, you will be perfect, meaning mature. You will grow. Yes, you're righteous, but you're going to grow into maturity. Something is going to shift in your spiritual life. Not only that, you will be part of my circle. You'll be one of my close disciples. Not only that, when we all die, and all of us will, and you go to heaven, you will have not only a place, a treasure in heaven. See, many of us think that all of us have treasures in heaven. As Christians, we have a place in heaven treasures depend on us what we did with what we had here and Jesus is telling this guy he says not only you will be my disciple not only you will follow me not only a lot of poor people are going to be super blessed and will be thanking God for the rest of their life for your life because you will be a miracle to somebody instead of always waiting for God to bring you a miracle into your life and he says when you die you will experience a treasure in heaven now you would think this guy would say of course Jesus would love to do that instead he turns away sad because generosity is the only thing that honestly in this area gives us joy. Lack of it brings sadness and the Bible says this because he had many possessions. I don't think he had many possessions. I'm not disagreeing with the Bible. I think these possessions had him because anything you're not willing to part with you don't own. It owns you. And God doesn't have a problem with you having stuff. God has a problem when the stuff starts having you. And you always contested what has you or what you have. Try to part with it. When you can't, that means you're a slave of those possessions. And those possessions have become your idol. And while you might not have a Buddha in your house, you might have something worse. Mammon. The only competition for your heart it's not the devil. Jesus doesn't say you cannot serve the devil and me. He says the devil and me or mammon. I want to challenge you today as we're ending our fast. For those of you who came out of town, those of you who came to Hungry Gen and maybe 
What I'm sharing with you right now kind of sounds strange. You're like, I really like this part about spending time with Jesus. Really like the part about actually going to church. Yeah, that's really, really straight, straight, straight preacher, straightforward. But this part, money and preachers just, I don't know, I can't swallow that stuff. It makes it very difficult. Maybe perhaps it's not me, but maybe it's perhaps some kind of a thing that you're still protecting. I want to challenge you and provoke you. It might not happen this month that you begin to think in this area. First time I was exposed to this idea was about 13 years ago. We were doing a fast and during this fast about maybe 18 days to, that I lasted physically and the Lord put on my heart that I had too much money in my savings account and I, I didn't have very little on the pastor's salary. Uh, it was very difficult to save those money and I was doing it for, to get married. And you know, I just broke up with Lana uh, three weeks before that and I had some head problems. And so during the fasting, God, I feel like he resolved that. And the Lord started putting in my heart, he says, I want you to start, take a portion, not all of it, take a large portion and to give it to the poor, some to the church and some to the homeless shelter. And I mean, I died million deaths considering that. I was hoping God will tell me to fast for 80 days. I was willing to die fasting 80 days instead of giving a large sum of money. Because I was like, Lord, I'm already fasting. I'm dying. I can't get married. I don't have any, any, any woman. And God says, you have a mammon problem. I said, no, I don't. I'm poor. The guy down the street who's a businessman, he has a mammon because he drives a Cadillac. I drive a Camry. I don't have a mammon problem. But see, that's how all of us excuse our own little idols. And when God went straight for the kill in my heart, man, I did not know that it will hurt that much. Fasting doesn't hurt compared to how a sacrifice does. And so that kills something that is so dear. I did not know how dear that thing was to me until I had to part with it. Now these things got easier for, for me and my wife. And we practice this. Whatever I'm sharing with you guys, I want to tell you something. I'm not, not selling you what I'm not using. <laughs> What I'm not doing myself. Last month, because of the building fund, after prayerfully considering, you know, we decided a little bit similar, but not exactly like this, to what this man did of taking our uh, entire savings account and then to give it toward the building fund. Now, it was painful, yes, but pain didn't last very long. And not only when we gave, but something broke. I realized that God actually used that because that amount that we gave was $100,000. We made some investments, flipped some houses, and we were planning to do some more flipping. And I was asking the Lord, you know, where should I invest? Which real estate? And just, I didn't have peace about the, a lot of the opportunities. And I felt the Holy Spirit put on my heart. He says, what about the Hungry Gen building? I said, yeah, but like, I don't get the money from that. He says, but you can get the treasure from that. I was like, yeah, but that's going to be after I die. I want to get something like next few years. <laughs> so I'm arguing with the Lord. And, uh, and, he, and he really starts putting my heart. He says, well, it is an investment. You will get the treasure like he told the rich man. And I said, yeah, but you know, I'm not a businessman. Like this is a millionaire should give that. Like, that's, I'm, a, I'm an average Joe. And this is, you know, I made this money. I should just invest it again. And God really put on our heart. My wife confirmed it. And then last month we did that. Interestingly, the third service, when we did it in the first service, somebody in the third service came from another state to get married on that service. And while they were there, they're not even Hungry Gen members. They were trying to get married at the altar after that. Me and my wife, we married them. And they gave exactly the same amount on the third service. Two weeks later, a pastor who's believing for their building in California watched the message. Who had a similar situation, flipped houses, had money, was planning to put it into his church. God puts on his heart, flies here and brings exactly the same amount to Hungry Gen. Two weeks after that, another businessman who might be sitting actually in the service right now um, from another state, God kind of puts on his heart and he does exactly the same. And it's really interesting because I felt like the, when the Lord led us and the reason why I made it public is not to blow a horn, but to also blow the limitation and for many people to begin to see that this is not something we talk about and believing God will send somebody, but God can use us. On my way home from that Sunday, I felt overjoyed, excited, account was empty so I, I stopped looking at my account and uh, but my heart was full of joy and on my way there turning to my street I felt prompting from the Lord I've been employed at Hungry Gen for 20 years and I'm very grateful I wouldn't be who I am today without God's house I've been through thick thin and wilderness and, and all of this stuff and grew through it matured through it still growing and still maturing but I've been a paid staff for hung, on Hungry Gen for 20 years I've never had a normal job I have people still making fun of me they said when are you gonna get a real job I don't know and 
On my way home, I felt the Holy Spirit put on my heart. He says, I want you to start next month to give what you're receiving from Hungry Gen back to Hungry Gen every month, all of it, to the building fund. Now that's more sacrificial. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I just, I'm not even, I didn't even have enough time to rejoice over this one and now I have to suffer the other one. And so we prayed about it and the Lord really put on our heart. And so I want to really encourage you that what we're doing here, I'm literally trying to lay, if I need to, my life down for it. I believe in this. This is not a building for me. 900 people that this will fit and 400 kids. This is more people being healed, more people being delivered, more people being touched. And as a pastor, I want to lead in that. Not just simply say, hey guys, really do that and not to do that myself. The other part is that today I have a ministry. Vladimir Subject Ministries and the board of our ministry voted, uh, felt the direction from the Lord from the ministry, not just personal but from the ministry to contribute 100,000 toward this building as well and we're going to do that today. So I want to invite those of you who are here. If you're part of our church, consider practically to start tithing or start giving a percentage each month. If you are part or not part of this church, the second thing, I want you to consider giving your best gift during this fast, as we're ending this fast. Maybe a sacrificial gift. Maybe some of you have never done this before. Just prayerfully consider. Now if this sounds strange to you and all of this stuff, research the scriptures. If I am wrong, don't do it. But if you see this in the scriptures and the Lord confirms that, I invite you to do it. We've been doing it. I practice this. I live by it. Our team does it. And I really see God's blessing on our life. And it's a privilege to do that. The third thing is maybe God will put on your heart to become a partner with a building campaign. Could we give those points? Uh, with a building campaign every single month. Whatever God puts on your heart, I ask that God will lead you. If He doesn't lead you, you can still give. The Bible says in Corinth, I think it's Corinthians where Paul says, whatever you purpose in your heart. That means you can make up your decision and make up your mind to give even if you don't feel led. The only thing that I would encourage is that there is no pressure. We don't have pressure. If it's not going to be you that the Lord will use, He will use me. If it's not me, He will use you, but He will use somebody. If you're a businessman here and maybe you've never given from your business, but you have a very prosperous business, I want to invite you to give from your business. Maybe you have a very successful business. You can reach out to your business partners and say, hey, what do you guys think if we help Hungry Gen with this? Maybe you can take the flyer and cover a particular portion of this building fund and say, hey, I can underwrite the parking lot. I can underwrite the HVAC. I can underwrite this. Prayerfully consider that. We have some businessmen from California who are gathering with other businessmen and actually praying about what as collectively they can do. And so if God puts on your heart, just want to let you know, I believe this is a good soil to sow in. We pray, we fast, and we also sacrifice. One thing I desired to dwell in God's house. One thing you need to spend time at the feet of Jesus. And one thing you lack and that is to live sacrificially when God guides you or when God presents an opportunity. Sometimes there's no guidance, just an opportunity is there. When the opportunity is there, there is the guidance that comes with it. We will not do a second offering. We would just ask you that if God puts that on your heart, you go to the church app or you, you do it on your way out, you can drop that in there. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance, and so many other things, go to HungryGen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.